So this morning I want to talk to you about that series I mentioned. And so if you'll turn with me to John chapter 1. And this is going to surprise you, but John chapter 1 really sets Christmas up. It's really what Christmas is all about. In John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, and I'm going to read quite a few verses here, uh, 14 of them to be exact. It says, in the beginning, over in Genesis 1.1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But even before God created the heavens and the earth, John 1.1, I have a, what they call a chronological Bible. It's a Bible that is printed in chronological order. And the first verse of that Bible is not Genesis 1-1, but John 1-1. Because before God created what we know as the heavens and the earth, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. That's John the Baptist. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, and that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. I was sitting last night and realized that for many years we taught that Jesus came to Israel, and that his own, Israel, received him not. But when you really study it, that's not what it's saying. It's saying he came to his own humanity, all of mankind, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word the word that was in the beginning, the word that was with God, the word that was God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You could preach that last verse for hours. But this morning I want to talk to you about the word being made flesh. How did God become man? It's an interesting story. It's what Christmas is really all about. We know in John 3.16 it says, God so loved the world, or humanity, that he gave his son, his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So how did this God, in Philippians it says that Jesus emptied himself of his divinity because Jesus is the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus, in coming to the earth, emptied himself of his divinity to become flesh. The passage says that he emptied himself to become a man, that he came to serve Humanity. So how did that happen? Well, in order to find that out, you have to go to the Christmas story. And so that requires us to go to Luke chapter 1. And in verse 26, we have the story. Now in the sixth month. Now what is the sixth month? Anybody know the sixth month? June, thank you. And December is what? The 12th. So if you subtract 6 from 12, Jesus was three months premature. See, we got this Christmas story all messed up. 
Jesus wasn't born in December. He was born probably in the end of May, beginning of April. And yet we celebrate his birth. In fact, I think the kids do a song, Happy Birthday, Baby Jesus. And we sing that during the Christmas season, but his birthday is probably April. In fact, many believe April 1st. That's why the sinners call it April Fool's Day. Oh, you're getting a history lesson here. <laughs> but in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed or engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what matter of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, well, here comes the news. You will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. That, that really right there is really a synopsis of what Pastor Earl shared with you from the book of Isaiah. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Jesus' humanity, the Word was made flesh in birth. But he was always the Son of God. And it says, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. That's what it's talking about here. And he shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And so we have a synopsis of this. The angel of the Lord is now telling Mary what Isaiah prophesied years before. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? That's logical. So she was a virgin. She had never been with a man. And now this angel shows up and says, yo, you will conceive in your own womb. And she's going, this doesn't compute. How can this be? Now watch, and the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Somebody out there trying to have children, just remember that with God, nothing is impossible. <laughs> Amen. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now Mary arose in those days, went into the hill country with haste to the city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the baby within her womb leaped, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. I want you to notice that when Mary entered the home and greeted Elizabeth, the baby within her leaped for joy because John the Baptist was not yet born and he was to be the forerunner of Christ, the witness, the Bible says. The Bible just told us that Elizabeth was six months pregnant. 
And as she began to prophesy, she said, blessed is the fruit of your womb. So my question to you today is, when did the Holy Ghost overpower her and overshadow her and conceive this child? Now, I got to be honest with you. I have looked it up. I have searched the scriptures. There is no passage in the Bible that talks about the Holy Spirit overtaking Mary, overshadowing her, and impregnating her. It's not in there. But if it was the sixth month, can you do math? You all still know how to do it? I'm not sure I know anymore with this common core crap. <laughs> but when I study this out, six months, Elizabeth is pregnant. During that time, she says, blessed is the fruit of your womb. So sometime between when the angel announced the conception of the word and the time she visits Elizabeth, she's pregnant. The child is already within the womb. So the question becomes, when did that happen? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because in verse 38, it says that Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord, watch this, let it be unto me according to your word. Now, how many know that not everybody in the world is born again? Now, I'm in church, so I'm assuming most of you are born again. What happened in order for you to be born again? Well, according to Scripture, the Bible says, so then, faith, because it takes faith to be born again, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of the Lord. And so you hear the gospel, you hear a salvation message, and you choose to believe. Am I right or wrong? And the moment you believe and confess the Lordship of Jesus Christ, you become pregnant with the Word of God. You see, John 1, chapter 1 said that in Him, the Word is the life, and the life gives light. I was meditating on that, and I realized... Three things take place when you get born again. You first receive the light, you be, your life, you become the light, and then you begin to process it by walking in love. Life, light, love. It's the process. Mary heard the message of Gabriel, the messenger of the Lord. She said, let it be unto me as you have Spoken. What did she receive? She received the word of the Lord, and the moment she said, let it be, she became pregnant with the word of God. John 1.14 said, and the word became flesh. When did it become flesh? The moment Mary said, let it be unto me. The same thing when we become born again. We believe and we receive the life of God. Everything John 1 says about the coming of the man named Jesus starts by the word of God being sown in Mary's heart. I was reading that passage, and it's interesting if you read slow sometimes, things you see you've never seen before. But it says that, that, that the angel said, it will be consumed, conceived in your womb. He's talking humanity here. Life begins in the womb 
That's why I don't agree with abortions. You can't say it's a thing. No, it's a living thing. Once it's conceived, it's alive. And when Mary said, let it be unto me, she received. See, see, over in Peter, the word is called the incorruptible seed. Once the seed is implanted, life begins. And so Mary said, let it be unto me, let it be unto me. And she became impregnated with the living word of God. The word spoken by the angel of the Lord produced life. The word received by Mary produced life. And the word received produces a living thing. And the life, according to John 1, 1, says that the word life produces light. You are a light because of the life of God. When you accept Jesus, the moment you accept him, the life of Jesus produces you to become the light of the world. Are you with me? The church for years has said, we are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. How did that happen? By receiving the life of God. Now, the word which was God was made flesh. Jesus became a man. And as a man, he had a spirit, a soul, and a body. He had feelings. That's his body, senses. He had emotions. That's of the soul. He wasn't just a spirit because he was the son of God because the Bible says that every human being has a spirit and God is the father of all spirits. He places that spirit within the womb. It gave life to Mary's womb and she became pregnant. Jesus had all the natural attributes of humanity just like you and I. He became a man. And even as a man, he was tempted, the Bible said, in all points as we are, yet without sin. Wouldn't it be nice to not mess up? Anybody here like me messed up and wish he hadn't? Come on. And yet we do. But Jesus never did. He was sinless. I began to think about Jesus, think about his life. Thought about some of the things he must have heard. You realize that Mary, in essence, was a single mom at birth. Are you hearing me? They had not yet become married. They were engaged, but they weren't married. And I am sure Jesus was called many horrible names because of the process of its birth and the timing of its birth. Sometimes we think about Mary and baby Jesus and what they must have been called and how they must have been ridiculed and mocked and made fun of. And yet sometimes we forget about poor Joseph. My name's Joseph, so I think about Joseph. I mean, he's traveling, according to the Christmas story, to attend a census. And this pregnant lady is not his wife. Whew. What must have he be called? The point I'm trying to make is that even from the beginning of such a divine appointment, such a God thing, there was ugliness. You know, you think if you're the son of God, life must have been easy. Come on, think about it for a minute. 
You're the son of God. The God. The one you were with and were in the beginning. I mean, life should have been easy. And yet most of his life, Jesus had to deal with rejection. He had to deal with being called names, made fun of, ridiculed, disrespected. And when you cut through it all, you know, it's good for us to think about the cross because we know at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. There's all kinds of songs about the cross, and yet sometimes we forget all of the shame and all of the junk that he had to go through to get to the cross. We look at the cross as a place of sacrifice where Jesus became sin for us. And yet, he dealt with all kinds of other emotions before that. In fact, let me take you there. Go with me to Isaiah 53. It describes the lifestyle, if you will, that Jesus had to put up with. It says in verse 3, He is despised, rejected by men, He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Verse 4 says, surely he has borne our griefs. He's carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. That was what Jesus went through during his lifetime to get to the point where he became the Savior. He was born to be our Savior, and it required him to be despised, rejected, living with grief and sorrows. But I love the return. In verse 5, it says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised. For our iniquities, our wickedness, our guilt, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Yeah, give him a hand. He did great works for us. I think all of us know what it feels like to be rejected. Hello? Hello? I remember the first time I, I, I can remember rejection was when I was young. Uh, I have a problem called shortness. And uh, I've always been short. My, my, my mom always talks about me climbing the steps at our church. Our church, once she came in the foyer, there was a step up into where the sanctuary was. And she said, Joey, I remember when you were just a little boy, your legs were no longer than the steps themselves. And you'd fling your legs over there and climb those steps. <laughs> but, but I remember the rejection when I would go to play basketball with the neighborhood kids. I was always the last one pecked. I know, it's terrible. It's almost ruined my life. (laughs) We're laughing, but some of you are still living back from those rejections. At some point, you just got to deal with it. I just one day looked in the mirror and said, dude, you're short, live with it. (laughs) But I remember what it felt like to be the last one picked. Hello. And think about 33 and a half years of constant rejection, being despised. Who are you? My name's Jesus. I'm king of the Jews. Now, I don't believe he ever did that, but you know what I'm saying. Because he always knew who he was. He always understood his assignment. He was to become sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God. I always like to explain to people why it says we might. 
because the choice is yours. You can choose to believe in Jesus Christ or you can choose to reject him. And the neat thing about Jesus is he never forces himself on you. He wants you to accept him openly and willingly. Amen? I started reading uh, the story of uh, Jesus in, in Luke. Let's go back to Luke chapter 2. In Luke chapter 22, I believe, starting at verse 26, it says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Jesus, Mary, excuse me, is approached by the angel of the Lord. She not only is told that she's going to bring forth a child, but in chapter 2, it goes on and says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole world should be taxed. This census was the first that took place. So all went to be registered. You notice I skipped that funny name there. Because I can't pronounce it. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. And it goes on and says that during that time, Mary's days were completed. Verse, verse 6, I say, think it is. So it was while they were there being registered for taxation, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. So all of his life, he has been despised all of his life. He's been rejected. He became a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And now he has emptied himself of his divinity and has come to earth in the form of a baby. I remember when my wife became pregnant with Kathy, we decided we were going to do the old natural thing and, and, and have a natural birth. So we went to these classes. I believe they were called Lamaze classes. Is that it? And, 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 and Kathy just decided to come a month early. She was a preemie, four pounds, 10 ounces. You could hold her in the palm of your hand. She was so tiny. She looked like a little old man holding in a hand. She all wrinkled. But she's grown up to be a beautiful lady. Anyway. During that pregnancy, while we were taking those classes, we were told that a child within the womb can hear the voices. And so I would, many nights, I'd lay down and put my head in Lynn's lap and just talk to the baby. I'd talk to Kathy. And then she got pregnant with Michael, and I did the same thing with Pastor Mike. And he, too, came a month early. Five pounds, one ounce. Two preemies. They just couldn't wait to get here. <laughs> but I would talk to him. I'd tell him he was going to be strong. He was going to be a great man. I, I, I shared some of my dreams before they were ever born that I was hoping for them. Are you hearing me? Now, they didn't pop up and say, Dad, it was really nice talking to you. I'm sure they're not aware of what I said to them while they were in the womb, but I spoke words of life and health and well-being to them because I didn't want them to come into this twisted world hearing negative things. Now, if that is the case, can you imagine what Jesus heard? She's pregnant. She's not married. She's having a bastard. Hello? Hello? And as they're journeying through Bethlehem, every place they stopped, they'd say, no room, no room. Even from the womb, he was rejected. Even from the womb, he was told, there's no place for you. And yet, he had a divine destiny. He had a purpose, not just for what he was going to do, but a purpose to be born. 
When John the Baptist later saw Jesus as a grown man walking down the street, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Everything led up to his coming to earth to be our Savior. Before his birth, he heard words rejecting him. During his lifetime, he was despised and rejected. And yet, all he wanted to do was the will of the Father. All he wanted to do was bring life and health, deliverance, soundness of mind to humanity. He came to bring wholeness to man. He wanted to bring salvation because if you take all of those words I just said and look up the word salvation, that's what salvation means. Healing, wholeness, soundness of mind, safety. In John chapter 1 verse 11 it said, and he came to his own and his own received him not. He came to humanity. He came for you and me. And can I tell you something on this fine Sunday morning? He's still coming for those who are lost. He's still seeking to save those who are lost. So the question becomes, do you have room for Jesus? We all know the story. Joseph looked for a place to stay, and finally an innkeeper said, I've got an old barn you can stay in. You know, that I love that verse. Not only in the Bible, but in the song Silent Night, Holy Night, Christmas hymn where it talks about Jesus being wrapped in swaddling. Doesn't that just make you want to melt? He was a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger until you really realize what a manger is. You know, in our minds, it was a crib. But it wasn't a crib. It was a feeding trough. It's where the cattle and the rams and whatever ate from. And yet Jesus was wrapped and laid in that manger. The Word had become flesh. The miracle of Christmas is that the Word did indeed become the Christ, the Son of the living God. But Christmas is just the birth. He then spent a lifetime becoming the servant of all, becoming the Savior, going to the cross. This morning I want to leave you with a thought from the book of Colossians, chapter 3. I got one minute and 22 seconds. I have learned to preach short. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, and I love this, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do it all. In the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The most important part is the very first word, let. You know, in our busy schedules, I'm sure, I'm looking out, I'm seeing some parents. I'm sure you got concerts coming up. Hello? How about some staff parties at work? All kinds of things, dinners. Things that are all prearranged and your schedule's full. And sometimes it's easy to get so busy that you've not allowed any time for Him. 
And so I want to admonish you this morning. Make time for Jesus this holiday season. I got to be honest with you. As the founding pastor of this ministry, I'm so excited. I, I did a service just a couple hours ago, and now this, this one is almost full of people, too. I'm amazed at how many people attend this church. I'm so proud of you because you made a choice. Listen now. You made a choice to be here today. So for many of you, you're already letting the word of Christ dwell in you. You came to receive a word. But don't get so busy that it's just eating, drinking, and open gifts. That's part of the holiday. That's what it's become. I'm not condemning it. But maybe during that time of gift sharing, you take time out as a family to be thankful. Maybe take the time to say, Lord, we make room for you in the midst of our party. You know, it's interesting that verse says that if you let the word of Christ dwell in you, it says, teach, admonish one another in psalms and hymns. And so, You know what I always liked back when I was a kid was when we came together at dinner time on Christmas and instead of just praying over the food, somebody started a Christmas carol. And then as a family, we sang together, prayed together. We made room for Christ. And so let me encourage you this holiday season, have fun, enjoy it. I hope you get what you want. I know I got what I want because I picked it out already. In fact, I'm a terrible Christmas gift giver because I call and say, what do you want? And as soon as they tell me, I get online and order it. Hello, no surprises, but they got what they wanted. Make room for Christ. Amen. Maybe you're here today and uh, you're visiting here and maybe you never heard the Christmas story quite the way I taught it today. But I will tell you, it's in the book. Christmas is about the Word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. Make room for Him. You can make room for Him today in your heart. Not just in your holiday schedule, but in your life. If you're here today, you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. I invite you to accept the gift of God which is Christ, his son. Become born again. Become a child of God. You know, in chapter 1, it says he gives us the power to become the children of God. How do I do that, Pastor? By praying in faith and accepting him as your Lord and Savior. All of you believers out there, this message was for you too. And sometimes, even as believers, we got to make room. That's why Paul said, let the word of Christ dwell in you. You've got to choose it. Amen? Amen? If you're here today, you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer with me. And I ask all of you to join in. Dear God, I do believe you raised Jesus from the dead. You also sent him to be the Christmas gift. And so today, I accept Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I confess you are my Lord. Now I thank you for accepting me just as I am. Let it be unto me according to your word. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here today, <clears throat> thank you. If you're here today and you prayed that prayer for the very first time and you meant it with all your heart, would you wave at me? 
Is there anybody at all that prayed that prayer? Way back there, a couple hands. Anybody else? Over there, God bless you. Over here, God bless you. Appreciate that. Isn't God good? Now, I just got to tell you, we had six people raise their hands, and I've counted four now. Ten gifts from God. Woo! God is good. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? You know, standing is a way you receive. And I'm going to pray a blessing over you, and I want you to receive it. Say this with me. Be it unto me according to his word. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this congregation. I thank you, Father, for their commitment to you. And so I ask you now to look down from heaven and bless and keep each and every one. Lift your countenance upon them, smile upon them, and give them peace, I pray. May everything they set their hand to prosper and be successful. I call them blessed coming in and double blessed going out. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. Merry Christmas.